Hi, I recently received this e-ink display from Electro. The display size is 5.79 inches, which isn't a size that you came across often. That's why I thought it would be interesting to experiment with it and try to make something useful. We'll do a quick review of this and see where it leads. The company that sells these displays is called Electro and single one costs around $32. You can find more details on their website and I'll put a link down in the descriptions if you are also interested. Previously I worked with the e-ink price tags and they were a lot of fun to experiment with. This one shares the same display type as those ones. However, it is quite long compared to price tags that I worked on before. Let's see how many I can put on this. One. That's two. Three. And four. It is even longer than four of those. If you don't know what an ink display is, it's basically the same display type that Kindle uses. They are usually priced for their paper-like look and they don't consume power while the display is showing content. While we are at it, let's compare the size of this with the Kindle Paperwhite size. It is a bit longer than a Kindle and the width of it is a little longer than the half of the Kindle display. Now I realize it has almost the same dimensions as a breadboard that we use on our projects. Hmm. Let's see what's under the hood. I removed four screws from the corners to get access. They left extra pinouts for you to use. And the pin numbers are written on the plastic for easy access. You can never have enough of those. Under the plastic case, there is another plastic cutout to make it more sturdy. Let's remove this one as well and let's see what's underneath it. There are also two extra threaded inserts for mounting to other locations. And here is the brain. It is an ESP32 S3 microcontroller. This one is a USB to serial converter, which is mainly used to program the ESP32. There is an SD card slot and might be useful for storing data on it. You have your two user buttons here and one rotary switch. There isn't much going on here. You also have lithium ion battery charging circuitry and a battery connector. There are some discrete components to control the e-paper display, a connector, and that's about it. Right now, I installed the demo firmware on it. It doesn't do anything other than demonstrate the basic capabilities of the display. But it is helpful to see the refresh rate and such. There are some e-ink display types, especially the three color ones. They have very slow refresh rates. Like it takes around a few minutes even to just refresh the page. So this one is one of the fast ones. Full refresh takes around like 3 to 4 seconds. Let me show you how it looks a bit more closer. Here it looks a bit glossy, but it's because of the protective screen. I don't want to remove it yet because that's the only thing which is protecting the screen. Maybe it's just me, but it feels a bit weird to read text off of it. I'm probably just getting used to reading books from the Kindle sized displays. Using the rotate switch feels natural to move back and forth, but pressing it is a little hard. Another possible use case would be to integrate it with Home Assistant. Because this device has an ESP32 S3 microcontroller on it and it can connect to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. But I prefer a touchscreen for this purpose. I wanted to see how it would look as a weather dashboard. And in my honest opinion, you would have so much wasted space on the display if you used it for this purpose. I think we can do better than this. I thought that display had a unique size. Apparently it didn't. I realized it's being used at my local grocery store for all price tags. There are even bigger ones. I wish I had a chance to get access to these large sized price tags. So many possibilities. While thinking, I remembered the LVGL library. It's an open source library that lets you create really nice user interfaces. I always wanted to use it, but I have never had the chance to before. It is usually best to use it with a color and touch display, but that doesn't mean it can't be used on e-ink displays. I've ported LVGL9 to Arduino to use it on this e-ink display. Right now it does nothing except printing out a label, 
Since ESP32 S3 has plenty of RAM, I should be able to use most of the library's functionalities. By the way, don't get it wrong, there is no battery in the device yet, and we can still see the content because of the characteristics of the e-ink display. If you also want to use the LVGL9 library on this panel, I'd suggest starting here. I uploaded the same code on GitHub. The link is down in the description. You can either use the git commands or go to codes and download entire repository. I strongly recommend using platform IO IDE extension on Visual Studio Code instead of regular Arduino IDE. The reason is that all the dependencies are resolved with just one click. To install that, open Visual Studio Code, go to Extensions and type Platform IO. And after this, you just type Install. After the installation of Platform IO extension is done, go to Pick a folder and select the one that you have just downloaded. After that, press the Build button or alternatively, you can press the Upload button to upload the firmware directly to e-ink display panel and Platform IO will download all the necessary toolchains and relevant dependencies for you. After porting it, to get familiar with the library and brainstorm ideas, I thought about making an RSS reader with it. This isn't a real RSS reader by the way. I just created a few pictures and labels and manually filled in the text from an RSS feed to see how it feels like. My initial idea was to get an RSS feed online, navigate up and down with the buttons at the bottom and read the descriptions by pressing another button. At first it sounded like a great idea and even with an unpolished interface like this, it looked good to me at first. Even though it fits nicely in your hand, I think I would have preferred a touchscreen for this. Maybe I am a bit spoiled by touchscreens, but I decided not to move forward with this idea. Another reason I moved on from this idea is how RSS feeds are created. For example, even though it is not online, all the text here is from Yahoo Financial News RSS feed. As you can see, none of the text here is really informative. That's because they don't want you to get your news from an RSS feed or just to read the title and be done with it. The reason is they want you to visit their website and generate organic traffic for them. There are some RSS creation services online where you can customize what you want, but I'd prefer a device that requires minimal or ideally no navigation with the buttons. That's why I decided to leave this idea behind. And since there is no significant work done here, I don't think the code worth sharing either. Well, I am curious about your opinion on the RSS reader idea with this. Leave a comment down in the descriptions if you think this was useful. This is the latest layout I came up with. I reserved the top of the display for the weather info. It gets the latest data for my city from Open Weather API. I'm showing only the data I find useful on the display, that's temperature, humidity, wind speed and visibility. I thought those might be useful to check before leaving home in the morning for work. And I can drive more carefully based on the weather situation. For example, there is a mist today. And the middle section is for the time and calendar. I am getting the local time data from the NTP client. The LVGL calendar widget was so nice and easy to integrate, I couldn't resist putting one here. At the bottom of the display, I decided to show just two news titles along with the summary of their content. The content is from newsapi.org and I am pulling the top headlines from there. Their API is also customizable, so you can, for example, get financial news instead. This is the final look of it. I could have added some functionality to the buttons. They are not hard to use, but I wanted something that just stays on my desk. And for something like that, I think you should have as little interaction with it as possible. So I need something to hold this, like a stand, that keeps it at a good viewing angle and hides the battery inside. Plus, I want this to have longest battery life possible. And the Wi-Fi functionality should be as limited as possible since it is the biggest power draw. Because of that, I made the firmware so it first pulls the data from the internet, refreshes the display and then goes back to deep sleep. I don't think it needs to refresh often, so I'll set it to sleep for about an hour.
Then it will restart and do the same thing again. If I need another refresh, I can just press the reset button on the back. That works fine for me. It would have been nice to refresh the time every minute, but for me, battery life is more important. Plus, I can justify my laziness by calling it a feature. Since this way, I can see the last time I got updated the news which is displayed on the screen. I don't have the type of connector they used here, so I soldered two wires on the battery connector and taped them to the PCB. It would have been nice if they added two through hole wires on the PCB, it would have made the soldering wires much easier. This is how it looks after putting the back cover back on. There is a gap between the cover and the rotary switch, so I ran the cables through there. I will share this code with you as well, but if you want to use the firmware I wrote, you probably don't want to see the weather for my city, you'd want to see your own city's data. And for that, first, of course, update the Wi-Fi settings with your own Wi-Fi name and password, and you need to get a new Open Weather Map API key. To create a free Open Weather API key, go to openweathermap.org, navigate to My API Keys, and click on it. Then select the generated key from here, copy it, and paste it into the code to a location, which I am showing you right now. And you need to update the city and the country code. You can find that information from this link and you need to click the first link which is provided here. I will put the link down in the description as well. Do the same steps to get your API key from the newsapi.org as well. And as a last step, to display your local time with the UCT offset, update the delta variable here in the ntp client.cpp. That's also located under the lib folder, ntp client, and here. I wanted to design a stand for this. Oh, I forgot to mention this hardware is open source. You can even find the 3D models on their official website, and I got mine from there too. My plan is to run the battery wires underneath the display through this open slot, and place the battery in this gap. That way the battery won't be visible on the desk and I think it'll look nice. I printed the stand with my 3D printer, but it didn't turn out well. The problem was that I used ABS filament, which I hadn't worked with before, and there was too much warping, making it practically unusable. After that, I tried to increasing the bed temperature, but it ended up breaking my Ender 3 3D printer. One of the most noticeable damages was to the LCD cable. The white wire got melted all the way through, but unfortunately that wasn't the only damage. I checked the power supply voltage and it is working fine. I don't think there is an issue with it. I had a spare cable, it's a short one, but it shouldn't cause any issues with the connection between the board and the LCD. I wish that would have fixed the problem. Unfortunately, when I powered it on, I get a weird behavior, and the LCD doesn't work. I think the issue is with the controller board, not the LCD. If you are thinking the issue because I am connecting the cable to the wrong connector on the LCD, that's not it. Even if I try a different connector, it still won't work. There is no visible damage on the controller board, so I am guessing it will be a long troubleshooting process. If it turns out to be something interesting, I'll know what the next video will be about. If you have run into a similar issue before and managed to fix it, please let me know in the comments. That would really help me out because I don't want to spend too much money fixing this. In this one, I'll have to rely on your imagination for the correct print. But even with the warping, you can get an idea of how it would have been looked at the end. I'll share the 3D model anyway, and if you think it's useful, you can use it as is. After thinking about what to do next, I realized my monitor has this slot over here. I guess it's for putting a pen or something. And it somehow fits here perfectly. I'm just gonna leave it here for now, or maybe even permanently, because it looks nice. It will fetch the data from the internet every hour or so, and update the screen accordingly. If I want to refresh outside of that, I can just press the reset button on the back. So let me show it to you.
The refresh rate mainly depends on the response times of the API services. The screen refresh itself doesn't take more than a second, but the Wi-Fi signal in my room is kind of weak, so that probably affects it too. After it refreshes, it goes straight to deep sleep mode and stays that way. Right now, it suits my needs just fine and I'm gonna leave it right here. That wraps up this video and if you liked it, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and see you next time.